uh, am i audible okay thank you abhi for a very kind introduction and uh, thanks to atri for inviting me um, here uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, to be here to uh, talk about my work so as abhi mentioned there are two broad aspects uh, to the work we do in the lab one is collective animal movement so this is sort of in some sense uh, collective behavior in uh, plant and vegetation ecosystems specifically looking at uh, uh, questions related to tipping points and self organization uh, so before i forget and uh, move on to the work i want to acknowledge various lab members so the work that i am going to present today uh, is largely the work that i carried out with my supervisor uh, phd supervisor jayaprakash in uh, ohio state and then more recently with uh, phd students sabiha and sumitra uh, as well as some interns and short term students and various collaborators as well um, so uh, this is the broad outline of my talk today so i will uh, introduce the idea of tipping points and uh, and i will uh, sort of try to convince that we need to develop some predictive models of tipping points and in that context i will also discuss how do we develop early warning signals of these tipping points and uh, so i will present mathematical theory in a rather intuitive way without focusing more uh, in, on the very technical aspects and uh, uh, second part of my talk will be or these mathematical theories you know how do we apply them in real data uh, and uh, uh, and what are the or the theoretical models which are rather simplistic in nature can they be applicable in real data real data and in fact we do find evidence for that and in the in the third third part of it which sort of uh, continues the same theme is that if we have spatial self organization how do they relate to tipping points okay so in some this tipping point is the so theme across all of these three topics i am going to talk about uh, if we have temporal data how can we infer tipping points if we have spatial data in ecosystems how can we infer tipping points okay so with that broad background uh, let me move on and uh, try to convince you that there are many many instances of tipping points in real world so what do you mean by tipping points so look at this uh, proxy data of vegetation in sahara uh, and as many of you probably know uh sahara as we see today was actually a very highly vegetated landscape some 5 to 10 10000 years ago so various proxy data suggest that this transition was not a gradual one but rather something that happened over very large scale but on a very short time scale for example you know around 5000 years ago this proxy vegetation shows a dramatic switch okay so these kind of transitions which happen on a large scale uh in large magnitude uh in the state variable but for very small amount of changes in the driver those are called tipping events or critical events so the key here is that if you look at the driver alone for example rainfall or grazing or other abiotic or biotic factors they haven't changed really much but the system has responded in a highly non linear way uh and with a huge magnitude uh and this is one example in a large scale continental system This is an example from a paper we published recently, where a semi-arid ecosystem underwent a transition. So here, what you are seeing is grass cover, which remains relatively low for a large, around 40 years or so. But then it has now settled down to a sort of a moderate grass cover state. Okay, and uh, and here, that if you look at the driver, as I will show, I will talk about this paper in more detail. That if you look at the driver, driver mean value hasn't really changed much, but the ecosystem has undergone a you know a qualitative shift and uh, another classic example that uh, uh, people refer to our financial crashes financial market crashes uh, again here there are no clear well defined drivers that seem to be changing but you know uh, as this famous examples from uh, stock market show there is a massive change in the entire uh, you know ecosystem of financial markets so and uh, these are the some some examples but they are also Uh, documented in lake ecosystem eutrophication is often thought to be a tipping point event as well and uh, community shifts can also have tipping points in fact my colleague shuman tabakchi has worked on some of these community shifts in grasslands um and uh, now over time uh, there are many many more examples of this tipping point events so all these sort of motivate us uh, to understand their features and implications and as i said the features are that there are large sudden changes and uh, a feature called hysteresis 
the idea is that if i now change the driver back to original state variable where the system was in a pristine state the, the you know this these changes do not go away the ecosystem will continue to remain in the new state you know for much longer duration than we expect and this is called hysteresis for example if there was a you know a level of grazing at which a, a grassland became a shrubland uh, if we reduce the grazing you don't see a reverse shift on the same uh, at the same point where the switch happened you have to reduce the grazing to substantially lower values and that's called hysteresis and these features have implications uh, in terms of ecology economic costs associated with these changes uh, and the fact that these are unexpected makes them both interesting from a scientific point of view as well as ecological point of view so uh, with this broad uh, uh, motivation so one question we have been trying to think and address is this so if i had only data from this part of the time series so when i say time series a state variable changing over time okay for example here uh, some proxy of vegetation changing over time it could also be vegetation changing over time it could be a uh, lake water quality changing over time uh, any relevant state variable for your ecosystem if i had only data prior to the shift could i have anticipated these tipping point events okay that's one question we are interested in uh, so can we devise some early warning signals of these changes in complex ecosystems and uh, uh, and with that focus how do we do this so we start with a very simple ecological model and uh, where which tries to mimic these features features of abrupt change and features of hysteresis see if we can predict or if we can have early warning signals of such transitions in mathematical models then there may be some hope that we have some of those signatures even in real data so the idea is idea of mathematical modeling here is you know we simplify complex ecosystems to bare minimal features uh, that mimic real world of interest and then try to see can in this model could i have made some early, you know predicted or if i have had some early warning signals that's the purpose of this mathematical model to so think of we as some biomass density which undergoes a classic logistical population growth in the absence of any further disturbances it would reach the carrying capacity k however we uh, assume that there are external disturbances such as losses due to grazing and this is basically uh, uh, hollings uh, functional response uh, i think it's called holling type 3 functional response which sort of has a non linear behavior for low values of biomass the grazing rate is very low but if it is above a uh, threshold it sort of increases sigmoidally uh, because real world systems also have many many more complexities which are not included in the model we assume that there is an element of stochasticity that is constantly acting and we model the stochasticity by uh, well known normal or gaussian distributions okay so now if we if you look at this equation forget the stochasticity for the time being if you look at the deterministic part of this equation and solve for which are the fixed points or the equilibria and how do they change with this a uh, parameter c c is a measure of grazing rate okay and how does that change as a function of grazing rate this is what happens so for this specific case i have chosen k to be 10 10 units so because of grazing uh, the system now has a reduced uh, you know equilibrium biomass density but what is interesting is that as you increase this grazing rate uh, initially the biomass density also increases gradually but there is a point called tipping point or a threshold point if the grazing rate you know is beyond this uh, critical point there is an abrupt switch in the equilibrium density of this ecosystem okay now that's the tipping point that this model is being able to capture the second one is let's say there has been a switch now if you reduce the grazing rate it will not switch back at this point you have to actually revert back to a much lower value of grazing rate before the system switches back to its original high density state okay so what is nice about this model is that it can capture two features i mentioned that of an abrupt change as well as the fact there is a hysteresis okay hysteresis also means that for the same value of grazing rate depending on the initial conditions system could have been in a low biomass density or a very high biomass biomass density state okay uh, now with this simple framework uh uh so i want to introduce two terms that uh, that's commonly used in this literature apart from critical points and uh, hysteresis so for example this point sometimes is also called a bifurcation point and critical point 
and I'm using a more generic tipping point uh, terminology. And if a transition happens at this point, at this point, we call them critical transitions or also called catastrophic transitions. Uh, you can also have a transition for a different reason, entirely stochastic reasons. Imagine that the grazing rate is really not close to this value, but somewhere here. Okay. But on the other hand, because in the ecological world, there are lots of environmental stochasticity, right? It's even if you are far away from these critical points, an environmental noise can push you across this barrier and have a transition. They are called stochastic transitions. Okay. So remember these two terminologies of you know tipping point or critical transitions and also stochastic transitions. Okay. Because this will come relevant to at some point of time, and I will remind you when it is. Okay. Now uh, so before I build on theory, so I, so this is a mathematical framework. Now, how do we make it more intuitive? So, uh, so one, one way to make this intuitive is the use, use the idea of develop, developed by Holling uh, uh, in 1960s and 70s called the idea of potential landscape or a ball in a cup and the idea of resilience. So what is, what exactly is that? So, so imagine that this is something called a potential landscape and this is the state variable. So if I were to start a ball somewhere here and make a small perturbation, what do you expect to happen to this ball? It comes back to this minima, right? Okay. And that is analogous to this the fact that if we are in a high density state, if you make a small perturbation, you return back to the same, same equilibrium. On the other hand, imagine a scenario if the ball is somewhere here. If I make a small perturbation, it actually comes back to this equilibrium now. That is analogous to the fact that if there was system was in this 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 branch. Any perturbation will come back to this equilibrium. On the other hand, a small, big perturbation can switch between two minima of these potentials. Okay, so, so the idea is that this potential and minima can be used as uh, analogous to thinking about how ecosystems change over time, and this minima can be thought of as stable states of ecosystems. Okay, so that means for this specific, in this specific case, there are two stable states: one with this biomass density, another with this biomass density. And depending on the amount of perturbations, system can actually flip back and forth between these uh, stable states. Okay. Now, this is actually very interesting for the following reason. This is not only a, just a conceptual framework, but it is also a quantitative framework. So let me illustrate that with the following. Okay. So, so this is the, the same, um, uh, uh, you know, same system where as a function of grazing, you have two stable states. Okay. And imagine you have a very uh, relatively low grazing rates. This potential function will look like something like this, which is actually a, a deep symmetric well. On the other hand, as you go towards this critical point, this potential function, uh, potential landscape changes in characteristics. Okay. Now, if you truly believe that ecosystem is like this ball moving in this landscape, what do you expect about the dynamics of this ball in this landscape? Because the shape of this landscape is changing its dynamics will change. So for example, here, if I make a perturbation, it's likely to go in both the directions. However, in, if, if the system is in this, this type of a potential, system is more likely to go in this direction than in this direction, because it's a shallower, shallower, uh, you know, uh, boundary in this, in the, in one direction compared to the other, right? So now this idea is also called critical slowing down. It's a very well known idea in mathematics and physics literature. So the idea is that you can think of dynamics of systems as ball rolling in this potential landscapes. And because this landscape is changing in shape, the dynamics changes. And in fact, when you have a very shallow landscape, the dynamics will become slower. And that's called critical slowing down. Critical because these features happen when we are close to critical points or tipping points. Okay. Now, this was a very well-known idea. And what we showed in one of my PhD thesis papers was that uh, because of the asymmetry in this landscape, the direction of movement is also going to get biased. And, uh, and, uh, and because of the fact that you have a shallow landscape, system will fluctuate more and more around the equilibrium value. So again, compare these two. So here there is a very steep potential which is not shallow. This is a shallow potential. Therefore, in this case, system will fluctuate a lot more from the equilibrium. Okay, the fact that we have increased variability near you know, near these critical points, you know, we can actually use that as an inference to say, you know, I am probably approaching these critical points. Okay, and uh, the fact that this potential is asymmetric means that the the time series as a function, the state variable as a function of time will be skewed in one direction 
compared to the other. So meaning there will be a deviation from typical normal distributions, which is highly symmetric. So we can use the idea that the system becomes more deviant from a typically normal distribution can be used as signatures of these critical points. Okay. So these were some of the ideas we proposed, uh, you know, about one decade ago in a theoretical paper. And uh, so let me demonstrate this using, you know, simulations. So what we are doing in this is that we are simulating the same model I showed, uh, but one is far away from a critical point, one is much closer. So when you are far away from a transition, you can see that the fluctuations are sort of symmetric around the mean value. And if you plot the histogram, histogram of the state variable, you find that the distribution is actually a symmetric distribution. On the other hand, if you are close to critical point, this potential becomes highly asymmetric and also shallow because of which this system has a much stronger variability. And if you look at the histogram, it's also skewed in one direction as compared to the other direction. Okay. And uh, uh, so, so at least our intuition or mathematical theory seems to work well with uh, numerical simulations as well. So based on this, we proposed, you know, returning back to the same question, are the early warning signals prior to these transitions? Sort of we proposed these ideas, you know, as a system approaches a critical point, we observe critical slowing down, we observe rising variability in ecosystem state. We also observe increasing skewness in the distribution of the state variable. Okay. And, uh, and conversely, changes in these quantities, okay, can be used as uh, sort of a, a you know, um, signatures of proximity to a tipping point or signatures of approaching a tipping point. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, let me just show you how we explicitly calculate this. So here, what we have done is, you know, we have uh, driven in a, in a mathematical model, we are driving the system slowly towards a critical point, it collapses. And, uh, and what we do is we calculate direct measure of critical slowing down called it's basically autocorrelation. What we find is as per the theoretical expectation, this autocorrelation increases before a transition has happened. Okay. So these quantities are computed before a transition happens. And indeed, they show signatures as expected by theory. Likewise, we find that the variance of this data increases fairly well or standard deviation increases uh, before the transition happens. Likewise, skewness also increases. I mean, of course, in this case, it increases in the reverse direction because skewness can be positive or negative depending on the, uh, the direction in which distribution is changing. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and it turns out that although this is a, this looks like we are computing fairly simple quantities, like, you know, mean variance, skewness and not a correlation. Something that all ecologists do when you have data, right? I want to emphasize two important points here. In a typical ecological data set, we want to get rid of correlations to sort of make useful inferences. What we are proposing here is that you must measure correlations. And if you observe increased correlations, it might tell you something about an upcoming tipping point. That's one counterintuitive prediction of these models. Secondly, we also simultaneously see increasing variability and skewness, and those are also useful as uh, predictors or uh, anticipators of upcoming transitions. Now to calculate this in real data sets sometimes is very tricky. Uh, we have to make sure because real data has many sources of drivers. So what we also did was we wrote statistical methods paper that sort of uh, tells you various statistical issues one has to keep in mind. Uh, uh, and uh, we also have an R package that actually helps you calculate these quantities. And you know it's freely downloadable uh, from our uh, you know CRAN uh, uh, as well as uh, this website. Okay, and uh, so uh, so I won't go into details of statistical aspects of this. I want to focus more on the conceptual parts. Uh, so uh, the next point I would like to do is you know how do we apply these to real data? You know are they really true in real data? Or are they just you know mathematical fantasies in some words? But before I go, if there are any questions, I can take uh, questions. Yeah. Conditions. Mm -hmm. Are they necessary conditions or uh, So actually, it's neither, unfortunately. So because uh, so this will be true when a system goes towards tipping point uh, in a relatively slow manner. Okay, if it happens very rapidly, then we it's difficult to capture signals. Okay, uh, but it will be necessarily true under the condition that system is reaching critical point relatively slowly. And in fact, uh, what I will show in uh, uh, our from our work is when some of the some of them actually break down. So I will be talking about them. Yeah, yeah. Huh? 
ha ha that's actually i i think i did not explain that very well so that's, that's a great question uh it's not very obvious why it should by the way so if we just go yeah yeah so it's actually yeah, yeah it's a great question it's a, it's a non trivial question so uh, if we go back to this uh, okay this picture right so you have the system uh, a perturbation returns back here so because you have a very steep potential system comes back to equilibrium very fast therefore it loses memory of the system very fast on the other hand here because you have a shallow landscape same push will take you further and come comes back to equilibrium because it is take longer to come back come back to the equilibrium it has a longer memory of the system and auto correlation as you would one interpretation of auto correlation of memory is the system right how similar is your system over space or time so because we have a shallow landscape here that that perturbation will remain in the memory system for a longer time so you have a stronger auto correlation but at the same time it also has a high variance because it moves far away from the equilibrium okay so where was i okay i finished all this uh okay so now i will first present some of the work that other people have done to sort of empirically test these ideas so uh, this was one experiment in uh, using daphnia uh, as uh, the model system so what they did was fairly simple they subjected daphnia populations this was a controlled experiment in the laboratory uh, where they subjected a bunch of daphnia populations to you know to sort of uh, extreme environment over time So eventually they collapsed. The populations collapsed. They also had controls where they did not subject populations to any stress. Okay, and they compared the two to see how are these trends of the various indicators we proposed, such as you know auto correlation in time or uh, variance in uh, in the in the population uh, uh, you know densities. How does it actually change? So uh, so. so they studied these four early warning signals variance quiness and correlations and uh, based on the controlled experiments in their system they estimated that so it was an year long experiments okay so they were slowly subjecting them to increase stress from their controlled experiments they know that the tipping point of the stress uh, comes at around 300 today okay now are they able to detect detect these signals before the 300 days the question so here they are plotting coefficient of variation and the way skewness what so the dotted line here represents the theoretically expected tipping point event what you see here is that uh, the so the, the the black line here is the control data and the blue represents the 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 condition of stress so what you find here is that uh, the skewness as well as the coefficient of variation they actually pick up signals about 100 days ahead of the estimated tipping point okay and this sort of gives a uh, validity of the theory but in controlled simple experimental populations that some of these ideas may actually be valid okay at least they are realizable in simple experimental systems uh, uh, and in fact the, of the four signals they measured of correlation uh, variance and skewness they found that variance and skewness were most prominently found in their in their examples in their experimental systems so there was another experiment that's with yeast by the way so they do exactly same but i want to highlight something you know this paper is a stronger evidence for the theory for the following reason in fact if you if you look at this how the population density of yeast changes with the stressor here it shows almost exactly same behavior like the model so they have a model system which is almost exactly identical to the theoretical framework we have been using so which means that you know uh, it's a good representation of the model under controlled conditions now what they do is they also do experiments where populations are subjected to stress or increasing dilution factor in their food materials over time and they actually find that variance uh, standard deviation coefficient all of them actually increase as expected by the theory uh and there have been more experiments now there have also a lake exp lake experiments in uh, wisconsin where they subjected a lake to a trophic cascade okay and uh, i don't know how many of you know the work of carpenter he has done massive amount of work on fresh water lake, lake ecosystems and uh, they also found that all these uh, indicators work as early warning signals in field condition you know in the field ecosystem but of course a controlled controlled lake okay 
uh, and there is also another long term data where uh, they used a proxy of i think based on the diatom concentrations if i'm right okay uh, and they again find that the lake underwent a transition from a clear water to a neutrophic state over a period of 100 years and but before the transition happened they picked up signals of variance and skewness before a transition happens okay so so basically there has been now a quite a bit of empirical evidence simple experimental conditions to you know uh, field large scale ecosystems as well okay uh, nevertheless we uh, one of the things we were still interested in was you know in natural ecosystems where there were no controlled manipulations whatsoever is it possible to pick these signals are there are there clear evidences of these kind of tipping points and are these signals valid that sort of is still very limited uh, maybe this one potentially is falls in that category uh, but they were using a proxy data rather than a real ecosystem data here okay so uh, in in that context uh, we we uh, met some chinese uh, people who had a very interesting system where uh, the grass cover of a uh, uh, of a traditionally well known uh, grassland ecosystem was in a very bad condition but over the years it actually picked up grass cover and actually became a, 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 a nice grassland ecosystem with a moderate amount of grass cover and uh, uh, and if you look at this entire time series over around 6 six uh, decades what you find is a nice bimodal distribution of the system state so now whenever you are in a uh, when in a, in a mathematical modeling framework of two stable states that are simultaneously possible an outcome is that you know the histogram of the state variable will look like a bimodal, bimodal distribution okay in such distribution mean is a very bad characterization because mean will fall in the middle of two states okay so looking at the entire pdf is an extremely useful measure so this shows a very clear evidence that the system has a bistable ecosystem and uh, if you looked at, now one thing we did was you know we are is this a real tipping point of the type we are thinking you know for for example did this ecosystem undergo a change for a very small or gradual amount of changes in the driver so we, in fact we did a, a lot of statistical analysis to show that this is not some non linear change but it actually is an abrupt change you know we uh, Uh, there is a fairly good amount of statistical evidence for this and based on this we found that 40th year is where an eco this ecosystem switched from a low grass cover to high grass cover which means that if our theory of early warning signals is correct if we measure the signals before the 40th year we must find signals so here is what we find we find that auto correlation actually does not show statistically significant trends in this ecosystem okay on the other hand uh, so this is you know the idea of critical slowing down does not seem to be correct in this ecosystem however if you look at standard deviation and skewness they actually show very very you know visibly clearly evident trends that to the extent that i don't even need to do any statistical tests um, uh, and sort of as is evident the p values are really really small uh, you know irrespective of the methods we use so what we find in this ecosystem is that half of our theory is true meaning the rising variability prediction seems to be true but not the lack of critical slowing down this doesn't seem to be true but this is seem to be happen so how do we explain this sort of half correct results right uh, you know uh, uh, that is that we observe in this data so what we had to do was we had to now revisit our modeling framework and look at so what we speculated was that you know one possibility in real ecosystem is stochasticity is an important driver if stochasticity is an important driver sort of i wanted to remind you this graph i showed you in the beginning you can have a transition close to the critical point uh, for small changes in the driver but you can also have stochastic transitions which happens away from this critical points but when the fluctuations are really large so we suspected that in in the in this dryland ecosystem maybe stochasticity is the real driver of this tipping point rather than you know um, you know a small small change near the critical point so maybe this might explain in fact when we do the modeling and look at all the early warning signal in the stochastic transition scenario uh, we do find that in the stochastic transition scenario the auto correlation actually does not change however variance and skewness does change which is exactly what we found in real data as well so based on this we sort of for the ecosystem we analyze maybe it's not a critical transition maybe it is not even a 
uh, stochastic transition with constant noise, but actually a stochastic transition with an increasing amount of noise over time. So, which obviously led to the question, what is this stochasticity in this specific ecosystem? Okay, so uh, we suspected it is probably rainfall in this region, which is extremely important. So, what we find is that the annual rainfall in this area hasn't increased or decreased much. The mean annual rainfall remains same over the years. However, if you look at the standard deviation of the lane rainfall, it actually has been increasing over the last three decades. So, that possibly explains this scenario. The fact that you have an increasing noise in the state, you know, in an arrival, that is driving the system to a transition. And that might be explaining the observed patterns of early warning signals. And it also sort of provides a more nuanced early warning signals when we apply to real ecosystems that, you know, stochastic transitions can also have a leading indicator, except that the popular idea of critical slowing down does not work. But rather, the idea of rising variability might be more applicable in ecosystems driven by large amount of stochasticity. Okay, And in this specific case, we sort of had some evidence that rainfall variability might be the driver of this transition. Okay, So now, uh, I want to sort of brief briefly also go through another work, interesting work, almost as a digression we did in looking at financial markets. Because if you look at various review articles on this top in this literature, they sort of even say with, no, this is the first sentence of the abstract, by the way. Let's say the complex dynamical system ranging from ecosystems to financial markets and the climate have tipping points at which a sudden shift to a contrasting dynamical regime may occur. So they sort of, they all hypothesize that financial markets are also critical transitions. If it is true, we should find evidence for critical slowing down, right? So that's what we set out to, we set out to find out. Do they show evidence of critical slowing down? Do they find evidence for increasing variability? These will be two predictions of this theoretical framework. And then when we did this, uh, we took uh, popular indices. Uh, and I want to show you results only with the Dow Jones Index, one of the most popular uh, stock market index. And we looked at four financial market crashes. One is 1929, 87, 2000, and 2008 being the latest one. Okay, And uh, I will just uh, show you with one of them. So what we find is that this autocorrelation, again, does not work as an early warning signal in the system, but rather meaning one of the predictions of the models is not correct, but rather variance increases in, you know, extremely uh, clear way. Okay. Uh, so there is again no critical slowing down, but there is raising, rising variability prior to these financial meltdowns. So based on this, you know, and we find this pattern to be true for all the crashes that we have analyzed. We analyzed around 15 different crashes across various global markets. In every one of them, we don't find evidence for critical slowing down, but we find evidence for high variability uh, prior to all of the crashes that we analyzed. So, which sort of makes the story very similar to the dryland ecosystem. Even in the dryland ecosystem story that I presented, we did not find evidence for slowing down, but we did find evidence for slow rising variability, suggesting that maybe it's again a stochastic transition. So, it's a stochastically driven transition that is driving stock market crashes. Okay, so. Um, so, sort of just to sort of conclude that part of the story, financial markets like the dry land ecosystem we analyze are probably not this critical or tipping point events, but rather they are better explained by stochastic transitions that drive uses that drive systems away uh, from a stable state, uh, even when you are away from a critical point. Okay, uh, so so now this is a summary table. It's not very updated. It sort of shows the current status of literature, uh, various. Uh, tipping point or various abrupt transitions. Okay, climatic shift, Daphne populations east, uh, east with a spatial network of east, as well as lake experiments, lake observation uh, from the long uh, long time series, the dryland ecosystem that I just presented, as well as financial markets. We find that the autocorrelation works in some of them, but not all of them. But variance does seems to work pretty much in every one of them uh, where it has been tested. And skewness again seems to work in scenarios where stochasticity plays an important role. Okay, so however, all these work actually ignore the fact that ecosystems have a strong spatial organization. Okay, uh, for example, if one way to contrast what I what I am trying to say here is, if you think of um, uh, the, the all the previous frameworks, assume that I can estimate uh, the population density. Uh, by sampling in one area as against in many, many areas. 
and there is a lot of heterogeneity across space that all of the previous models ignore but treat the entire ecosystem as a single sort of a point so so the next part of my talk will talk about how spatial organization influences many of the things that i have spoken about uh, and it turns out that without going into too much of details the same principles apply to spatial models as well and in fact uh, we can uh, construct a spatial model uh, and uh, where the idea being that uh, you have many 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 small areas where in each of them the logistically growing population is a valid assumption but the different spatial pockets are connected by dispersal of seeds okay and uh, and even in those kind of systems uh, tipping points can happen and when they happen uh, for example this is a simulation where we drive the grazing rate over time uh, the grazing rate increase over time what you find is that from a the color light color here represents a high biomass density and the dark color represents a low biomass density over time system actually does collapse to uh, from high density to low density states and as this happens we can measure what is the average density of population in this area to look at this it shows this kind of a non linear behavior okay now we can also measure the metrics the equivalent metrics of the of what we spoke about in the last one which is spatial variance how variable is this population density over space and how skewed is the distribution of population density over space okay so what is interesting is the following if you look at the spatial mean average value uh, look at up to this point there is hardly any change in the spatial average which is what most of the ecolog ecological studies tries to estimate right however if you look at the spatial variance okay it has already begun to massively increase you know it in fact has increased from values of 1 to around 5 5 or 6 you know roughly even 2 years before this non linear transition begins you know there is a 300% increase in the spatial variance a change in the value of skewness from 0 to 1 and and both of these have happened before the onset of non linearity or tipping point in the mean data so what this suggests is that if you by measuring these simple spatial metrics like variance and skewness and if you find that they are actually increasing in this fashion we can infer that it's an early warning signal of an upcoming tipping point okay so uh, and uh, and uh, what we also then do did was generalize these to other types of spatial patterns and i will talk about this in, uh, in the last part of my talk okay? so i'm going to skip this slide okay uh, but if you want to know empirically validate these ideas what do you really need you need high resolution spatial data of ecosystems over time and ideally you would like that these ecosystems have collapsed right and then you look at what happened before the collapse has happened before the tipping point happened but we as of today don't have such a such very nice data set so we had to use a trick so we use the following trick in the in uh, in one data set so this is uh, um, this is a data from serengeti ecosystem and if you look at serengeti ecosystem it has a very nice spatial gradient of ecosystem state in the in the center of in the in the middle of the ecosystem is a beautiful grassland area as you go in northern as well as the western directions it becomes more and more woody okay uh, and in fact what we found was that if you look if you plot the frequency of states okay for example if i let's say if i take it 10 by 10 km by 10 km by grid and then if i look at how many of the pixels there correspond to grassland or a woodland we find that surprisingly when the when the rainfall is low it's mostly a grass cover so one here represents you know fully grass covered system like a grassland system uh, but if you look at higher rainfall values like around 1000 mm or so some some pixels are in the woodland state so zero here represents woodland by the way and the one represents grassland so there is a bimodality in the distribution of ecosystem states meaning that some areas are in the grassland state some are in the woodland state again sort of showing evidence that there are alternative stable states or bistable states in this ecosystem so what we did was the following okay uh now we have spatially or if you change if, if you look at as a function of space the driver is changing the ecosystem state is changing So if we just plot the grass cover as a function of mean annual rainfall, in fact, they actually show this kind of a highly non-linear behaviors. Okay, and uh, and what we thought was imagine a scenario uh, where instead of 
a driver value changing over time, we can think of this ecosystem as driver value changing over space. Okay, so we use the idea of space for time substitution, and we were looking at okay, if if you know if the space for time substitution is reasonable, then if you look at snapshots over time, I can replace them by snapshots over space. So as I am going looking at snapshots over space, we should find that spatial variance and spatial skewness must increase before this nonlinearity were to emerge. Okay, that was the hypothesis we maybe made. And this is the theoretical expectation. So this is space, and this is the ecosystem state variable. And theoretically, of course, these are the expected trends. You know, spatial variance must increase, skewness must increase, and as should the correlation and, and the meshes of spatial Fourier spectrum. I won't talk about this much more detail. But now, if you look at the real data transects, you know, we look we we looked at how these patterns are changing over space. In fact, exactly as per the theoretical predictions, you know, the spatial variance does increase. Before the onset of nonlinearity in these ecosystems, okay, and likewise the spatial skewness also increases. In fact, you know, if you look at these two patterns from theory and you know data, they are sort of remarkably sort of you know um, you know similar at least qualitatively. Okay, and we found this to be true for many many transects that I showed you in the beginning in this ecosystem, and uh, and uh, you know you can if you are interested you can look at this paper in GB that was published last year. So. So to just, just summarize this part of my talks, uh, so I sort of I gave you a brief overview of what are tipping points and how we can use mathematical theories to come up with uh, early warning signals of tipping points. And then I showed you some uh, empirical evidence. Uh, uh, if we had time series data, if we had state variable over time, from those data, can you pick up signals of these early warnings? And in fact, what one of the key result was that when systems are driven strongly by stochasticity, some of these patterns might get, you know, masked. In those cases, rising variability in the state variable is a very good metric. But controlled experiments do show evidence that all the indicators work really nicely. Okay, and uh, we also have now shown some evidence that these kind of metrics will be valid even when we have spatial data. Okay, and uh, of course, we have used only space for time substitution. Which is uh, which can be questioned on some grounds, but it is it is promising. Uh, all this provides some promise that we can apply these to real data, real data sets as well. So I know have a small bit on this, um, but depending on the questions and time, I can cover this or I can also stop my talk right here. What what would you recommend, Anjan? Yeah, yeah I'm like, so if uh, if there are no questions, I can quickly. Uh, do this the idea of pattern formations? Huh? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So, so so far, just sort of give a bigger context here. So, in this part of my talk, I was talking how if we had state variable changing over time, how can we get early warning signals, right? Here, if we had spatial patterns over time, how do we get early warning signals? Now, when I say pattern formation, uh, if you look at ecosystems at very high resolutions, okay. Uh, the spatial patterns they actually have very very interesting patterns uh, you know they are patchy right and uh, they occur in clusters it's not that trees are randomly dispersed they occur in clusters uh, and in some cases they also occur in very regular shapes for example look at these bands that are occurring in this look at this sort of a labyrinthine patterns over a fairly large landscape scale so in the previous set of theories, we did not account for these kind of pattern formation. So they were all sort of the coarse theories. You know, the first set of models treated entire ecosystem as a point. The next set of models were better, but they did not, they averaged out all these kind of details. So the next set of models we want to look at is that if, because we now can get high resolution data, can we do better with our predictive measures? That's the main focus. Uh, and uh, so, so these are also called self-organized patterns, and there is a whole theory and set of literature on this. So our idea is to connect the pattern formation with the resilience of ecosystems. Can we say something about the stability of ecosystems and their proximity to tipping points based on these kind of data sets? So, so now it's important to account for the mechanisms of pattern formation when we want to infer something from these patterns. So what is very crucial in all these pattern formation models is that the plants interact with one another via a variety of positive or negative interactions. 
and to to observe clustering you invariably need some amount of positive feedbacks meaning presence of one plant sort of facilitates the establishment of a plant nearby in comparison to establishment somewhere in the middle of a bare ground that's because when there is already a plant despite the fact that there is competition it, the soil nearby has probably more uh, nutrients it can absorb uh, there is a better soil moisture availability better nutrients and so on so despite competition for resources there is already some amount of extra nutrients that does help in establishment and the, hence there is a positive feedback between individuals positive interaction between individuals and depending on the nature of this interaction we can get a variety of patterns okay and i won't go into all the details because the focus of what i am going to talk about is you know how can we use the patterns to say something about the stability of ecosystems okay so we use this now very fine resolution model where we think of ecosystem as a land uh, a very fine resolution grid grid where each grid can have a tree so we are really looking at uh, you know um, thinking of these models as uh, sort of realistic over a meter resolution or so okay so let's say let's imagine there are lots of trees in this landscape so a tree for example can give birth to one of the neighboring cells with some probability p it has its own probability of death at the same time there is also we also incorporate positive feedbacks meaning if there are two trees nearby the nearby cells have a higher chance of even higher chance of germination so we incorporate baseline birth and death rates we also incor incorporate the fact that when there are already a couple of trees or one or two trees the neighboring areas have higher chance of germination so if we include all these we are actually able to uh, reproduce many many observed patterns in nature and uh, so one question we try to address with these kind of models is the following um, so all along we have been talking about are we close enough to the critical point but you can ask can i actually get an estimate of the critical point what is the rainfall value at which system will collapse what is the harvesting rate at which ecosystem can collapse right if you want that quantitative information none of the earlier metrics can do so in one of the papers uh, uh, by my student sabiha what she showed was that if we had this transect like data which which sort of take you take an ecosystem from one one sort of ecosystem state like say a grassland to a woodland the driver is changing if you look at intermediate areas they will have high huge amount of variance and huge amount of correlations if you identify those areas and look at the driver values and state variables that would be a very good estimate of the critical point and in fact we we sort of you know verify this idea mathematical idea by analyzing lots of data sets from uh, australia and africa where there are where we had to identify uh, areas with no human disturbance and areas which have which other papers have shown that there are critical points and tipping points in these systems so we use those as baseline and we use this simple me method to estimate critical points and in fact we showed that it really works really well the the another this is the work of sumitra in fact she will be presenting a thesis uh, colloquium uh, on friday uh, for those who are interested to sort of summarize what her her her, her work basically shows that when you have very high resolution data some of the earlier metrics we showed actually can be can provide some spurious signals signals that are nothing to do with the actual dynamics but purely because of randomness alone okay so so she proposes that one must use uh, spectral signatures uh, the idea of spectral signatures is that when you have a, a landscape with various patterns you can think of them as many many uh, combinations of many many uh, periodic patterns and then by looking at the contributions of periodic patterns we can sort of uh uh make inferences about their stability so one specific prediction of those theory is that the power spectrum must become a power law behavior as we approach critical points okay so now how do we verify this theoretical idea what she has done is she has looked at uh, uh, a bunch so pre last year there was a paper published about a uh, data set of spatial imagery from a variety of semi arid ecosystems Uh, and these are 50 meter by 50 meter tiles of 0.3 cm resolution and uh, we also have various abiotic and biotic variables for these sites and based on this what she is able to show is that uh, as for a given ecosystem exactly as predicted by the model the, the the stronger the positive feedback is higher the chance of a abrupt collapse it's a bit counterintuitive prediction and in fact how do you now verify this by looking at the power spectrum the theoretical prediction is that if you increase the positive feedback this power spectrum must become 
uh, more straight line on this log log axis and in fact that's precisely what she observes i'm just showing you one such data from that entire landscape but there are many many such examples uh, from our analysis so what we're basically claiming here is that by by having very high resolution data we can ramp up our predictive ability of what might happen to these ecosystems in the future okay so with that sort of uh, uh, brief overview of the pattern formation and link to tipping point I just want to end my talk uh, and uh, thank you everyone for your attention. Take some questions about. So uh, typically, when we are defining, trying to define a state variable. Uh -huh. uh, and the state variable itself will be responding to a lot of obvious drivers. Mm -hmm. So in, when we are trying to uh, define uh, the indices for the state variable, uh, is it necessary to model out the obvious drivers, in fact, uh, of, of those drivers on the influence of those drivers on the state variable? And what you get is basically a uh, what are the perturbations in that code. This might be easier to interpret. Uh, and also to define over time and space. That's one thing with that. And another one is that uh, if you actually had data that you could uh, analyze at different spatial resolution, mm -hmm. so you could, um, you know, you have finer data, but you should be able to, from course to finer, if you do that, you should be able to see that the, this particular uh, signal of uh, Okay. So the first question, I think it's a uh, great question. So in the statistical methods paper that I sort of uh, just mentioned but did not discuss, so we do detrend all the data. We detrend the data and measure the fluctuations around the detrended data. So that's something we always do to sort of remove the obvious trends that are, for example, seasonality might be one such trend, right? Um, so we do remove those, and then we look at the properties of fluctuations uh, around those sort of mean detrended values. And uh, theoretically, it does make sense, as rightly pointed out, uh, because what we are, if you think of variance or autocorrelations, um, sort of the, by definition, they're all measures of properties of, uh, you know, fluctuations. Right. So, so, so if there is some periodic element in the in the in the driver that is making our pattern also have some periodicity, we don't want those when we're analyzing. So, absolutely agree with you on that. On the second point, the answer is both yes and no. If we so one point that I did not measure mention uh, discuss much, but it's one of the chapters of Sumitra's uh, thesis, the first chapter of her thesis. So, consider a hypothetical scenario when we had. Uh, very high resolution data where every pixel is presence or absence of a tree. Okay, that's the sort of a best data we can think of, right? Now, if I take those kind of data, so zero ones, a matrix of zero ones, right? So it turns out that if I calculate spatial variance and skewness, that that those those patterns will be fully spurious, because <coughs> so one way to think about it is you know if I have a matrix of zeros and ones. Spatial variance does not depend on how they are arranged at all. So in fact, we can't even distinguish a null model from the actual variance. So if you have very high resolution data, we actually get null model trends. In fact, we can't even distinguish. So how do we resolve the issue? So, so one thing she shows somewhat surprisingly is that to get the signals, we have to coarse grain the data. We have to actually lose some resolution. And only when we lose the resolution, the observed quantity becomes something like an average quantity. That's when it actually matches with the theory. The theory is built not for a very high resolution data. Theories are all built for somewhat intermediate scale coarse resolution data and how those coarse variables are changing over time and space. So in fact, so in some cases, um, especially when measuring variance and skewness, high, very high resolution data can actually give you spurious results. But the power spectrum result I showed you, I think your prediction will be perfectly all right. We haven't tested that. But I think your prediction that as you go from coarser to finer, the strength must increase. I think that will be true in that case. Yeah. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, have you actually looked at so right now you have to 
absolutely Ex excellent point so i haven't done that and uh, yeah but i think so some people have tried but it's a very difficult question uh, so what we are so mathemat so so if i were to translate your question to first the mathematics question so we must have a network model that also has tipping point behaviors and uh, now all the results i have presented are the true network models so mathematically the answer is yes but the measurement of those is extremely difficult yeah that's a that's a absolutely yes that's, i think it's a fantastic question so the only work i am familiar with which comes close to what you are doing is actually shumanta bachi's work where he has analyzed this uh, grassland community it's not again it's not birds it's actually plant community and uh, what he does is he measures the uh, some 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 metric of uh, entire community itself how that is changing over time and suddenly community composition changes to something totally different when you look at the pca of the uh, state variables so now i don't think he has then measured the early warning signals in those data so so i don't think he has spatial data though i mean the thing is you know, they are all very small like you know 1 meter by 1 meter plot changes in community composition in 1 meter by 1 meter plot now can that be interpreted as a tipping point which is because all the theses are effectively be as built assuming a much larger spatial scale So I don't think that will be easily applicable there. But it's a great question. Though. I mean, I have absolutely no doubt. I think to make this more applicable to smaller scales, we have to work a bit harder. Yeah. Um. So my my question is, I I don't know. It's probably very simple, but uh, it's more predictive. So you, uh, the work that I that you've done on uh, on the markets is very interesting. Um. Have you dabbled with some current data to look at? You know. Look at some predictive. I mean, to some extent, understand what may happen. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, my student Nikunj, who did some of the you know work, he developed an shiny app. I don't know if you're familiar with our studio has a um, app building feature called Shiny. So it automatically grabs uh, data from very of various stock markets from various websites, it automatically plots all the indicators. And if you go to that uh, website, which is available from my website. uh you can actually look at the current trends but i haven't followed up on that yet i have a student who will be doing that in the next summer in the coming summer yeah so uh, you can show up from that uh, that question uh, you know the whole idea of early warning systems is that some action can be taken mm -hmm. or just we know or we even give us knowledge that something is going to mm -hmm. in some instances you might want to say some action mm -hmm. uh, and is curious with the With the stock market, say safe, uh, say whether uh, the knowledge of such a mm -hmm. potential thing could result in some self-limiting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that's the hypothesis. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So finance, so economists uh, have an in principle opposition to looking for early warning signals for this reason. So because the economists always look at equilibrium models, so the so any perturbation must sort of very. very rapidly uh, sort of come back to the equilibrium that's the first assumption they make and uh, and they also assume that since every human being is a or a trader in this case is a rational human being with perfect knowledge the moment i have the idea of early warning signal early uh, the, the, i have an early warning that you know it's going to crash so everybody will act in such a way that the crash will not happen how could the crash have happened before so it could argue either way their argument is it shouldn't happen And and somehow they do a, use some very funny logic to conclude that therefore there should be no early warning signal at all. So because we do see crashes, despite this theory, the only way to explain the now crash is it's entirely a stochastic event. But you know it has zero any early warning you predict will have a zero predictive value. Their their theory, but there is a uh, there is a sub community of economists, the econometrics people. They don't mind doing all these things. They keep on doing all these things. Yeah. And you know they have come up with various measures as something called heteroscedasticity and all, uh, and they're all they are you know some of this correlate correlate with some of them but not all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a very uh, basic question. Sure. Uh, 
why do we need stable uh, systems or systems at equilibrium? As mm -hmm. uh, the basic models here are from the work that was done in the 1970s, and after that, so much work on non equilibrium, non equilibrium systems that has come out. So, why do we actually need to go back to that idea of stable uh, systems? And uh, related to Abhi's question, uh, we have warning systems to kind of uh, bring out some action, right? Uh, when it comes to management or behavior of people. But when it comes to edit, grasslands, range lines, people make the system very complicated. Mm -hmm. So, how do you see uh, these models actually being useful? So first question, uh, the answer is both yes and no. So the models I showed technically do fall under the non-equilibrium systems. So if you did not have stochasticity of the types, I did not emphasize as much on the stochasticity part because it becomes a bit technical. But you know, if you do account for stochasticity of the type I have been incorporating, so they would be called, uh, I think, non-equilibrium models only. Okay, that's the first, uh, but you said you're right that the baseline, the limiting case of that goes back to them. It's useful to have that though, right? It's useful to have baseline, which we know well, right? <laughs> uh, the second uh, second question is much, much more, more difficult to answer. I don't have an answer. Uh, and I would like to discuss with people who sort of work a lot more in the field, sort of see what can be done. Uh, uh, we, as well as others, have tried to simulate scenarios to sort of see when these can be action, when they can, when these signals can provide actionable uh, inputs. And the uh, answer is both yes and no, depending on how strong the signals are, you know, how much data you have, and uh, you know, how well you can interpret data. Okay. Uh, so, so even in fairly idealized systems, answer can be yes and no, depending on the type of sort of nature of drivers, nature of data, quality of data, and then how. It turns out that the same data set given to two people who are reasonably well qualified can lead to slightly different interpretations for so the same statistics, by the way. Okay, so, so those also play a role. So it's a decision making is a much, much more complex process. And uh, I don't know if people have formally tried to incorporate decision sort of making process into these kind of models. I think there's some efforts, but uh, I haven't done that. But you're right that you know, if, if I think of this ecosystem, Bunny Grassland, what should I do? That's a <laughs> much, much, much more difficult question. Yeah. We're still in the very nascent stage from that point of view. Yeah. So, uh, first, you mentioned that you have a very interesting where we see behaviors of the variance and skewness increasing. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything common in the way the magnitude of variance and skewness change with respect to the trend mm -hmm. in the state variable? Yeah. So, that's, that's a great question. So, if we have I say, uh, so if you look at the trend in the uh, driver, and if you plot the trend in the variance, the trend in the variance curves will be much, much more sharper. That's one way to sort of, uh, dis, you know, sort of, you know, disentangle trivial effect versus actually the real effect. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, there are no further questions. Uh, a round of applause to Mr. Vishu and uh, thank you Vishu for your